So we're going to do something a little bit different and go right into narrative theory. Hope you guys are ready for very little archaeology and a whole lot of creative writing theory. Um, <coughs> so to introduce this with this really good graphic that I spent a half an hour on, uh, I'm Alex Patrick. I'm a zooarchaeologist at the University of Bradford, and I know nothing about creative writing. Uh, so when I saw that they were doing a narrative session uh, at TAG, I decided that this would be the best way to take one of my friends from my hometown in New York to come over to the UK and do a conference with a bunch of people <coughs> in a specialty that she doesn't know anything about. Uh, so Valerie is a, uh, doing her MFA in creative writing at Stony Brook in New York. Uh, so we figured we'd collaborate a bit on uh, learning about narrative. So to tend to start off is um, something that I think most people in this room know about because I follow about half the people in this room on Twitter. Uh, SciComm, or hashtag SciComm if you really want to be accurate. Hugely important nowadays with the internet, social media, everyone's got an Instagram or a Twitter page or a WordPress blog if you're me and you're writing about what you do. It's really important nowadays, especially because we have a huge audience of, you know, some of you guys have thousands of followers. If you're me, you have 384 followers on Twitter, which I'd like to have more, but you know, you can't have everything apparently. So just the idea of being able to be more engaging and more interesting to the general public is really important with SciComm being a big thing nowadays. So what we decided to do is kind of look at the scientific writing versus narrative writing. Um, they are very similar. They have very similar uh, structures. Uh, we'll talk about them a bit. Um, and scientific writing, which in our case is more of academic writing, journal writing, the writing that we all in this room do most of the time, versus narrative writing, which is more storytelling, uh, what you find more in fables, things like that. They haven't always been separate. Um, the example that I think of is in anthropology, uh, ethnographic works, uh, a lot of the best known ethnographic, uh, ethnographic works use narrative to showcase their research. But I feel like in what we would call the hard sciences, the sciences that have a lot of hard data, you don't really uh, use this to our advantage. So if you want to start talking about yeah. that. Yeah, which uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense because narrative is an archetypal communication method. Um, it comes from naturally needing context for a story, then having action that moves the story along, and then a conclusion being um, a resolution or an impact for what you've just heard. So in scientific writing, you'll have your introduction, your thesis, and then all of your data points, um, followed by a conclusion, meaning maybe some more research needs to be done, or how can we apply this to the field of academia that we're in. In narrative writing, you have an introduction. Usually, the first paragraph of the story will actually tell you not only the language that's going to be used and how the story is going to be told, but also, if you look at it, will actually tell you <coughs> how the story is going to go when you go back um, and read it later, which is very similar to introductions in scientific writing. When you go back and read the introduction, you're like, oh, they said everything right there that was going to be in the paper. Um, so. We kind of took a look at all different styles of communication and we parsed it apart into the three basic parts. So, for example, jokes are an archetypal communication method. We have introduction, an amnesiac walks into a bar. Action, he goes up to a beautiful blonde and says, conclusion. So, do I come here often? Um, or in fables, we also have introduction. The shepherd boy is bored watching his flock. Action, he cries out, wolf, wolf. His neighbors come running. The boy laughs, what a great joke. Um, they leave, he watches his sheep. A wolf actually comes. The boy cries, wolf. The neighbors don't come. Conclusion, there's no believing a liar even when he speaks the truth. Um, the use of fable as a way of communicating information is probably our most basic form. In um, writing and in composition, the educators, Ponso Dean, um, would actually teach fable as their first lesson in writing and composition courses for remedial students. Um, it's the most basic <coughs> example of how we get communication across. Intro, action, conclusion. So it shouldn't be 
shoved aside as something that's very simple because actually within that we have everything we need to know about how we're communicating narrative. Um, so moving on from that, comparing science writing and narrative writing. A lot of what we've been talking about today has been a debate that's been going on for a really long time in communication circles, which is the debate between the rational world paradigm and the narrative paradigm. What that means is the rational world paradigm says, well, people just need facts and data, and if it's all laid out in a logical way, they'll be convinced and think, oh, this is important. <coughs> Which is what you would assume, right? If you lay out a good logical argument, people will follow along and be like, that's really important. But the narrative world paradigm says otherwise. It says that humans are social and emotional creatures, and they will relate to and respond to best what closely correlates to their own experiences. Um, this is something that you'll find in creative writing a lot, where even if something is being told a story from all the way halfway around the world, the more detail is used to describe and the more concrete the details are, the more somebody can have a tangible experience from those details, the more they can begin to relate to the material that's being told because then it's a shared experience, so it becomes their own experience. Um, so this is also the rhetorical strategies of logos, ethos, pathos that we're talking about. Scientific writing relies heavily on logos and ethos, so being logical and being an authority, whereas narrative writing relies heavily on pathos. Um, so the narrative paradigm tells us that pathos is the most important part of getting your point across whereas the rational world paradigm tells us that logos and ethos are the most important part. But we can combine them, which is great. Um, it seems that people don't really agree that these two things can be combined, but because the two structures are so similar, we can actually just steal a couple of things from either side and combine things in a really effective form of communication. Um, the problem is that yeah. you have to do it successfully, which, <laughs> which is hard that we didn't do at all. Uh, so I had the idea for an experiment, and I use the word experiment in the loosest terms possible. Uh, <laughs> basically, uh, we created a scenario, a very typical uh, environmental archaeology scenario. For me, for, as a zoarch, it was heavily to do with animal bones. Uh, so it created a fictional site, had its own backstory. I wrote up a bunch of data points, um, and as and ISP, M and I, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So me and Valerie sat down and wrote two different papers. So we have paper A, which is the more narrative paper that Valerie wrote, and I wrote paper B, which is the more standard academic journal type paper. Uh, so we had a group of people read it and review it uh, and answer a couple questions on the effectiveness and how engaging they were. Um, and uh, it was a blind test, obviously. They didn't know uh, what paper was technically a narrative paper, although to be fair, you could probably tell really easily which one's a narrative paper and which one was a science paper. Uh, so we got results back from them. It was actually quite mixed. Um, so most people agreed that the narrative structure was a lot more engaging than the scientific paper, which I was told outright was boring, which is fair. Um, <coughs> But a surprisingly amount of people actually liked the scientific paper's easy to follow writing. They said it was a lot easier to follow than the narrative, which kind of you know, went a couple of different places uh, with different characters, things like that. Um, and they also mentioned that uh, paper B had charts and diagrams, which they found easier to read than paper A, which was more or less just words. <laughs> um, so what we learned is that you can't just smush them together. <laughs> like that, you actually kind of have to put thought into it. Um, I mean, there was also a lot of biases in this project. Overall, we created this scenario with the intention of this is the interpretation and this is what we want to get out to the public, which as you all know, is never the case in a, uh, I wish it was the case, uh, but you know. Um, and also the largest contributor to the bias is Valerie, as talented as she is, is not an archaeologist. She's not an archaeologist. And I didn't even think of that when I sent her <laughs> my data, and she sent me an email back saying, what does this mean? <laughs> so if you want to go into... Um, yeah, so 
basically, you can't just shove a bunch of data at a writer and hope that they'll interpret it into a really lovely narrative for you. Um, Susie, the, the film that you showed actually reminded me a lot of when I sat down and I'm like, okay, God, what am I going to do with <laughs> all these numbers of fish bones that show up in a, on a random site that we've invented? Um, so it was, it was pretty tough for me as a writer to try to translate it into normal person speak, I guess. Thanks. Um, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Um, no, but it's, it's really an issue of fluency, where you can't just have an outsider come in and say, okay, well, yeah, I'll just form this into a nice little narrative for you. It's you guys who need to be writing this, because you're the ones who are immersed in it, and you're the ones who understand the impact of what you're sharing with the public. So you can't just give it to somebody who might think, oh, that's interesting, okay, like a bunch of fish, great. Um, you know that the fish are important, so you need to tell the people why it's important. Um, so, knowing that that's a bit of a tall order, we've uh, produced some tips for you. Um, narrative Writing 101, hello. I will be your host for this evening. Um, so, first off, you need to consider what kind of words you're going to be using. Don't be too jargony. It doesn't mean you need to remove all of your trade language right out of your papers, but really just consider who you're speaking to. And this goes back to the structure, the initial structure that we have, the narrative structure. In your, introdu in your introduction, you are sharing the language that you're going to be using to tell your story. This is common across the board. So are you going to be speaking the language that these people are understanding? Who are these people? But we'll get to that in a second. Um, another thing that's really important, and I I don't think I can stress this enough because it's such an important part of writing in general, but concrete images are such a great way to transport your readers and to share experiences. And this is one of the main ways that you can get people to relate to your work. So either just simply sharing images from site or creating really strong sensory images, sensory um, sensations, that's redundant, um, within your work, <coughs> telling them what you were feeling there, what people might have been feeling a thousand years ago, what the experience was, the more specific you get with sensory detail, the more a person can relate to it and share in that experience, and the more, according to the narrative world paradigm, that they'll actually care about what you're saying. Um, also framing, what's your angle? Of course, you should always be thinking about what's the impact this go this is going to have, how are you going to enter into this conversation with the person? Welcome back to primary school. Um, yeah, so we have the really basic narrative structure, but what we need to remember when we're building a narrative structure for um, scientific writing is that it's not just a straight chat up to climax. You need to build your data points on top of each other in a way that makes sense, so is logical. Um, but also is leading to kind of an emotional climax as well. Um, so make the emotional impact of what you're saying a result of everything that's been built on. Tell people why it matters to you, really, is what I'm saying. Like, why is this pottery shard important? Like, why is it just tugging at your heartstrings? Tell them, because if you tell them in enough detail, they'll actually get it. Um, and then following action, conclusion, resolution. Obviously, this is where you can straight up tell them why it matters, why it's having an impact on their life and the story that they tell about themselves as a human, wherever they might be living or how they think of themselves in the grand scheme of humanity. Um, and then lastly, these are the main things you're going to always want to be thinking about. Who are you talking to? It's not going to be the public. You need to get more specific than that. Are you speaking to a group of school kids who live near the site? Are you talking to a bunch of decision makers? Um, who are you trying to share this story with? And why does it matter to them? Because sometimes it really does matter to them. And sometimes it really doesn't seem like it matters to them. So you need to make it seem like it really matters to them. And then lastly, how can you connect the material to something already present in their lives? Because if it's something already present in their lives, then they'll actually care. 
So that would be great. That'd be really good. And basically, just to wrap it up, I mean, we've kind of touched about this in other papers uh, in this session, but for us as environmental archaeologists, why does it matter? Getting support for our projects, funding, which, funding. as we all know, is very hard to get nowadays, uh, speaking as a self-funded PhD student, um, <laughs> and just the idea of making things accessible. <coughs> as environmental archaeologists, we're dealing with stuff that is, even though it's from the past, has to do with uh, things that we have in uh, right now, you know, the environment, nature, animals, things like that, things that people can relate to. We just need to make that relatability accessible for everyone.